So I'm Yvette Hardy and today it's my great pleasure to interview Fikri Elazuzi, who is a writer visiting us in South Africa from Flanders. Um, I want to start off just by reading a little bit of Fikri's um, bio so you've got an idea of, of what he's done and who he is. Um, he made his debut in 2010 with Het Schapenfeest. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Is that, a, is that okay? Is that a pronunciation? I don't know. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> um, okay. So that was the first novel in a trilogy. And then Drari and Die Nacht followed in 2014. And then Alain Ale Zee rounded off the trilogy in 2016. And he's also written other novels. His novel De Belunung in 2019 was inspired by The Man in the Hat, who was one of the suspects in the terror attacks that happened in Brussels in, in March 2016. But he's also a theater maker uh, and, a, and a theater writer. And he's written a number of theater pieces, including Tourist and Rumble in the Jungle, 2013, um, Raisin Jihad in 2015, as well as Pax Europa, and Alien for Actrice Sara Deru, 2016. Um, and then he's been working with his theater company, um, which he'll tell you more about, I'm sure, within the interview, Junior Caesar. And with that theater company, he created several works like uh, Malcolm X and Dear Winnie in 2019, and Dear Winnie refers to Winnie Madikazela Mandela, and then Who's Tupac in 2021. So all of these were acclaimed as highly relevant and original multimedia theater pieces. And they were many of them aimed at young audiences. And then besides this, he's also taken on the role of a columnist um, and he's written for, for various papers um, papers in, in Belgium. Um, and he's also written a book for children, um, which I got a little taste of the other day. He sent me um, the, the PDF copy. Um, and so he is a really um, very multi-talented working in a number of different areas as a writer. He's received both the ARC praise for the Freie Wurt, so I'm assuming that's about freedom of speech, um, as well as the Ultima for literature in, in um, Belgium. So really acclaimed for his work. So Fikri, um, you've done a lot of writing in your life. What made you want to write in the first place? How did you start to write? I think I wanted to express uh, my feelings and ideas. I uh, felt the need to put my thoughts, emotions, and experiences on paper. And it had to be on a safe place, in a safe place where no one looks over my shoulder and I could fully express myself. And it allows me to unleash my creativity so I can create worlds, characters, mm -hmm. and stories that would not otherwise exist. Mm -hmm. So... So I want to share my story. I want to show that I had something to say. Mm. Yeah. And and who do you feel you write for when you're writing? Do you feel like you're writing for a particular audience? And if you do feel like you're writing for an audience, who is that audience? Like my ideal re reader is someone who is like genuinely interested in my, my story. Uh they take time to read and appreciate the nuances and the details so that who empathize a reader who empathize for the characters mm. and they understand the emotions and the characters and readers that they are they are willing to be surprised in a kind of way people also like young people who recognize themselves in the story whose world it's like rarely told but Everything that I, I said, it applies to younger, younger readers because younger readers are often like very open-minded. Not that all the readers are uh, are not open-minded, but young younger readers are like my ideal audiences. But of course, I want as many readers as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And so you, at some point you started to write for theater specifically, right? Um, what was it that made you start writing for theater? How did that happen? 
it began with my debut novel, uh, Tchapafis, and it was quite successful. And it was written in a theat theatrical, in a theater uh, style with a lot of dialogues. And afterwards, I was approached by two different theaters and asking, they were asking if I was interested in writing a play. They also asked me if I had any experience with theater. I said, yes, of course, but actually it was no, because I was never been involved in theater or I saw in my life, so two, two plays or something that I even remember. So I just begin, went for it. And my first play, won immediately an award and like wow. that's this history yeah? and now i have written like 50 plays but i was like fortunate that i met the right people otherwise it would be so successful and and who were those right people who were the people that really helped you start to write for the theater uh it were like uh Junior Mtombeni, a really good friend from uh, my theater company, uh, Junior Caesar. Uh, you have like Michel de Kock, he's now the uh, uh, director of a, of a theater, a big theater in Brussels. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have my first theater company, Sync Collective, with uh, Nadia Ben Abdesamad and Ikram Aula. They really helped me. So I had like really a lot of support for. Support a lot of people that that helped me mm. and also Cesar Janssens from uh, uh, Junior Caesar so we had like immediately a connection and uh, it was a lot of fun yeah amazing that's great so your theater works particularly more recent works have often focused on a really strong hero or heroine and you know taking on characters like Malcolm X and Winnie Mandela and Tupac Shakur um what is it that draws you to write plays about people who have actually existed um, and also using the style that you do? So I don't think we've spoken about your style at all, but there, you have a great love of hip hop and that often winds its ways into the play that often is a medium that you use. So what draws you to to using hip hop and to speaking about these particular people? Like again, as a kid, I uh, didn't really have role models except for like, footballers, rappers, and also like, I had some role model, but also Malcolm X was a role model. And I was like fascinated by, by his life story and his uh, self-sacrifice for a cause. Mm. And also like jazz, hip hop uh, was also something that I really liked. And we started to make a play and it's the same with Winnie Mandela. I saw a documentary about her and I was impressed by her, her life story. And then I asked Junior Tombeni, uh, I talked about him, South African and a director. Uh, his father knew Winnie Mandela and regularly uh, he was exiled to Belgium and then he sent letters to Winnie Mandela. And for us, that was the beginning of the play. Yeah? So we we started with the letters and we created the, the play Dear Winnie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. So you've written a number of novels and, and famously there's a trilogy about a boy called Ayub. Um, and you've said that you, you want to give boys like Ayub a voice in your work. So can you tell us more about this character and whether he relates to your own life at all? Whether Are there autobiographical elements there or who is Ayub? Like in the beginning, when I'm starting to write, I was still finding my way. I was too afraid, afraid of being judged. And I didn't want people to know who I was. And then at the moment I realized I need to expose myself in some way. And I need to give it a bit too much of myself to be more honest. Mm -hmm. And if people then think they know who you are, or have a judgment about me, then I would just have to live to live with that. And no one knew I was writing until my novel, Hatschapavis, appeared in, in, uh, in the stores. But I received like a lot of positive feedback. And for many readers, it felt very personal because I 
sounded quite honest, yeah. even though 90% of my book was made up. And from that moment, I feel like an an honest liar. <laughs> so, and the, the person, Ayub, in the book, he goes through a kind of identity crisis his entire life, searching for his place in society. He wants to be someone. He wants to become a football player, become a writer, but it doesn't work out. And he felt like he didn't belong anywhere and desperately, desperately wanted to belong somewhere. But a little bit like me, yeah. So am I Ayub? I think, I think so. I'm that awkward boy who's unsure, who finds himself amazing and also terrible, like a bun bunch of contradictions. Yeah. And that's me. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit more about the language that you use in your work? And maybe, I mean, if you'd like to read something that you've written just to give us a taste of, you know, how, how your writing sounds, um, feel free to do that as well. You want a long one or a short a long one? one? Long one's great. I, I, yeah, whatever you want to read right now is great. Okay. Uh, this one, a long, fast one. Mm -hmm. Ik ben X, net zoals Malcolm getransformeerd, bekeerd, niet alleen bokser, ook een poëet, een troubadour, geen hoer die elk lichaam weer masseert. Ik sta recht, niet voor de klant, maar voor de onderkant. Voor de mensen aan de rand heb ik toegezegd om eindelijk te beginnen aan mijn gevecht. Ik ben X. Wat betekent mijn naam? Wanneer staat X in de graas? Ik ben niet slim, ben niet grappig, ben geen vechter, ben een psychopaat van deze natie. En dat is handig. De psychopaat in mij maakt mij zelfstandig. Ik sta recht. Ja, je bent sterker vast wel, maar ik zit vol haat. Klaar om te beginnen met de daad. Toch wil ik bedanken voor de goede raad. Bedankt om mezelf te leren haten en mijn kop vol te steken met gaten. Enkel omdat jij de mandaat houdt om te zeggen hoe ik me moet gedragen. Ik ben X. Ooit gevangen in een slachthuis van prestatie, een vroegere knecht van deze natie, met cipier die mij bewakert, die mij geleerd om mezelf te haten en alles het liefste bij het oude wil laten. Schuldig verzuimen zou ik hiaten. Ik sta recht. Iemand die liever hoopt op een grootschalige rel in plaats van vast te zitten in zijn isoleercel. Ik wil dat hier ontploft, zo al hun lichaamsdelen worden afgestoft. Wel, sta ik nog altijd recht? Of begin ik wat te hangen? En kun je met al dat loshangend vlees niets aanvangen? En nu we dit hebben besproken en ik mijn vinger in jullie oog heb gestoken, wil ik nog één ding vertellen. Ik ben X. Bij mij draait niet om vecht. Ik steek neer enkel op mijn recht. Ik ben een kop, maar ik denk er niet aan om te knechten. Geen coach, geen manager, niemand die me zegt wat ik moet doen. Ik sta recht voor wie ik wil horen. Ik bij het oren. De anderen zullen smullen lullen. Want de enige daadkracht is de kracht van hun maag door al de onrecht die ze slikken. En toch blijven ze nederig knikken. Je twee en traag. Dankjewel, meneer. Dankjewel, mevrouw. Zulke mensen moeten eigenlijk dood. Met zulke woorden blemmen ze hun eigen hond. Ik ben X die hoger wil mikken. Oog om doog. Gedaan met snikken. Heel achter je droog, voor wat? Om op bezoek te gaan bij een psycholoog, voor dat? Om achteraf te zeggen, wat heb ik gedaan? Wat was nu mijn betoog? Ik steek deze vinger opnieuw in je oog. Je leefde in de waan van een ordinair gevecht. Je proefde van de overwinning, je was eraan gehecht. Maar uiteindelijk was je niet meer dan een gerecht van degene die ineens lustte. En ik weet dat ze in je hoofd blijft rusten als een gevaarlijk wit spook. Hopelijk kan mijn gestook hem eindelijk doen vluchten. Want ik ben X en ik sta recht. Getransformeerd, bekeerd. Niet alleen bokser, ook een poëet. Troubadour, geen hoer die elk lichaam deel masseert. Hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we can hear the theatricality in the language and the rhythm and, you know, the, and the way you're using rhyme and this kind of, is a real punchiness to, to the way you're writing, even though I didn't understand every word because I don't understand, you know, language fully, obviously, um, but I, I, I got a real sense of that. So, so talk a little, bit, a little bit more about your language. How do you, how do you, what, what do you enjoy in working with language? Yeah, I like to experiment with language, yeah? like, uh, and in my book, Dread in the Night, uh, it was the beginning, I used a lot of street slang and or, called youth language, and it was something that was rarely used in uh, Dutch literature, but uh, I wanted to write as authentically as possible. So my, my dialogues felt really real. And I incorporated Moroccan slang, like Turkish and English influences, like how the youth is talking right now. And it became like a, a major factor in my book. And initially, in the beginning, critics had their, their doubts. 
but because the book started started gaining so much success in schools and with younger people, it has a second life and was nom- nominated for awards and even included in uh, the Belgium literary ca- canon, canon, literary canon. And I felt like standing among all those dead writers, <laughs> it isn't dead for a living writer. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing though. So is so the book is now studied at school as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. The, so for me, it's uh, an honor mm. to go with uh, at schools, and you feel like uh, younger white uh, uh, female students are like talking slang, and uh, it, it's now like normal. In the okay. beginning, it's really strange, but mm. but now it's normal that that. Uh, you just talking like uh, it's now in the dictionary and, and stuff so wow that's quite an impact <laughs> a little impact so because in about five years there will be another slang like a more Russian slang or whatever or, to, or like uh, from uh, Syria it always changes eh? so yeah so, I mean, just mentioning Russia, Syria, I mean, right now we're in a pretty troubling time politically. There's been such a strong swing to the right in Europe and and all these ideas of diversity and equality and, you know, all of that are kind of being challenged. And there are many political leaders who are, who are basically preaching, you know, exclusivity, essentially. Um, and then wars. We have wars in Ukraine and Gaza and Syria and Sudan, you know, in other parts of Africa. We are really um, seeing a huge rise in conflict and also a rise of leaders who seem to think that they are above the law. And in in the case of Trump right now, apparently uh, he is above the law. You know, it's it's really worrying. So you address all of these kinds of themes in in your work in, in different ways. Um, and but but you're speaking to young people. So how do you go about tackling heavy issues like like these? Uh, I try to make my <clears throat> voice heard by addressing like the the painful truth, and sometimes that can be uncomfortable uncomf- for young people. They may not they may not want to hear it, and I also often use humor because it can soften some pains. But for me, it's still important that you still feel some pain so that the message doesn't get get lost mm. and i still get often get irritated in indignant without becoming cynical mm. and i see that indignation in other art forms like uh in painting and also in festival and for me that indignation is is necessary to do some changing because if people become too comfortable comfortable with themselves and become like cynical or uh like or a bit uh about this mm-hmm. then they are yeah then we are really in trouble so you need to have like yeah be angry and do something about it and that it's necessary for me not to do to do nothing it's like yeah yeah no absolutely um i mean there's a kind of an activist streak in a way in what you're saying you know that you're wanting to provoke thought but also action that you don't want people to be complacent and just accept you know yeah activism is really good but uh you can get the people go going with the activism if it's like an positive activism it's really you can get the crowd and you can really point some issues Mm. because we have a lot of issues right now yeah yeah yeah. is is there a piece that you'd like to read us which maybe speaks to um some of these issues in in any way um yeah yeah i will taste yeah you need Relatief is mijn uitnodiging vandaag. Palestijn of Marokkaan, 
dat lijkt op elkaar. Dezelfde keelklanken, wenkbrauwen en altijd kwaad. En op straat zijn wij de schreeuwende woordvoerder. Sympathiek, maar wel ongevraagd. Relatief is de junkie die snak die, pak, die zich laat pakken en in zombiaanse toestand wegkwijnt, om daarna zachtjes uit de samenleving te verdwijnen. Op deze aarde volgen we allemaal de richting het leven. Niet zo moeilijk om te studeren. Met geluk als de grootste factor is het niet makkelijk om te studeren. Relatief zijn voor- en achternamen. Iets dat we in het begin altijd proberen, maar het duurt maar heel even. Al snel komen nummers in de plaats. Kort, krachtig, zakelijk. Ziel en hart aan de kant geplaatst. 1 plus 1 is 2. Klopt als een bus. En met een statistiek doe je ook niemand kwaad. Relatief zijn onze gedachten dat wij het Vrije Westen nog steeds verheven is, met een moreel vingertje het bombarderen en de genocide weten te relativeren, oorzaak, gevolg en waarom ze geweld plegen. Als iemand uit zijn huis wordt verdreven en in erbarmelijke toestanden moet leven, ja, dan is het niet moeilijk om je te laten recruteren. Relatief is de woede en de verarming van onze samenleving. Als puntje bij paaltje komt worden rijke rijker en arme rampzalig eindigen, iets waar we nooit bij stilstaan. Zoals een blauwe smurf, die je wurgt. Welke kleur krijg je dan? Relatief zijn de hipsters die de wereld willen verbeteren en het onrecht niet willen slikken. Die biologische lattice gretig op hun laptop tikken. Bommen in Gaza. Like. 40 baby's onthoofd. Emoji met veel verdriet. Geen baby's onthoofd. Keer de leugen. Slok van de latte en je afvragen waarom zo ingewikkeld maken. Oké. Okay. Like. Het zit erop. Hard gewerkt vandaag. De wereld is verbeterd. Hard gewerkt. Snel nog een paar selfies nemen, zodat ik het met iedereen kan delen. Relatief zijn moeilijke vragen. Vaak een alibi om daar niet over te praten. Zijn we te laf? Voelen we ons schuldig? Kan het ons achtervolgen? Ons werkelijk schade? Zeker als we er geen voordeel uit kunnen halen. Een moeilijke vraag. Iets waar ik over pieker en soms slecht van slaap. Een kannibaal. De laatste avondmaal. Hij vraagt Chinees. Wat is het dat je serveert? Iemand van vlees en bloed? Of rijst met stokjes dat je gaat geven. Maar niet dat ik in clichés en stereotypen wil spreken. Relatief zijn die irritante voicemails. Wie spreekt het nog in? Wie luistert ernaar? Stuur gewoon een bericht. Voicemails. Dat slaat op niets. Gaat nooit diep. En sinds de dag dat ik werd gedumpt, luister ik daar nooit meer naar. En als je dat meemaakt, voicemails. Het achtervolgt me nog steeds. Ik kan het nog steeds niet aan. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to talk a little bit about that piece? Oh. Hey, yeah. I'm thinking like I'm dead already, but I'm still breathing, just still breathing. I miss my own life. I used to be the anxiety, the and everything. Yes, yeah, it's not. I used to be having everything normal. I just want to live normal. I just want to shower normally. I just want to use bathroom normal. Normally, I can't just breathe normal here. Yeah. Everything is getting worse. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That part, uh, the text was about like we were far away and we we're just doing our, our life. And sometimes we uh, doing some likes in the the horrible stuff that that happenings in Gaza. But we are doing not enough uh, for them. So that was the the text that I uh, read, like in some festivals where they like uh, doing some stuff for uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, so... Mm. And, yeah, and really... the voice message that you've just played, just tell us about that. Yeah, it's it's a woman that is really desperate and she wants to have her life back. She just wants to make a living, make, uh, to take a shower as normal people. She's, she's telling why it's always happening to me. She's like really desperate. Uh, And for me, it felt so powerful and also so so sad. Yeah. And it's still yeah. still go going on. Uh, uh, like nothing is happening. So 
for me it's like really uh, yeah yeah terrible I'm living in belgium comfortable life making uh myself upset because i have maybe cold coffee or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh. yeah absolutely so you, you're about to run a w writing workshop for us in Johannesburg, and we, you're going to be working with 10 writers who are creating work for 11 to 14-year-olds. Um, and we've called the, the the workshop Pushing Boundaries for Young Minds, um, because I think there's this idea that very often when we write for young people, we kind of underestimate them or we talk down to them or you know we become very educational in our approach. Um, and we're really hoping to kind of open that up and and to look at how it is that we can write for young people in a way that is really going to stretch them or, you know, engage them. Um, so what are you hoping to inspire in the writers that you're going to be working with or, or help them deal with um, in terms of their work in this coming week? Yeah, I want, first of all, I want to like to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. like in what ways they write, what their motivations are. And, and also I want to tell why writing for children is so important. Mm -hmm. Of course, the writer should do, do nothing, especially re remain themselves, but I would like them to especially challenge challenge themselves so and return to their nine-year-old self. Mm -hmm. Everyone has been uh, nine years old, so they shouldn't you don't need to use research or something and tell the story from that perspective mm -hmm. and let them completely go and use their imagination, put it all together and but in an uh, honest way. And then we, we're going to read it and we're going to work together so we can create like 10 amazing stories. That's the goal. Yeah. Like... Yeah. To yeah. impress uh, on Friday, I don't know which day when we do a small reading. So, yeah, I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. So, I have already stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're very excited, and I think the writers are very excited as well. Um, so right now we're uh, at the Freistart Künstlerfiers, where it is pretty cold <laughs> in Blumford Day. <laughs> Um, but uh, you've seen a little bit of, of South African theatre um, and you've also been here before. Um, so what are your impressions of South African theatre that you've seen? Um, is there anything that you take away from you at the moment? I know you're going to see a whole lot more today, but maybe just some impressions. Uh, they are often very rhythmic, very physical also in their movements. Like in, in Belgium, we're just very stiff. <laughs> I saw some amazing actors who really mastered the craft mm. very well. Like, uh, but I find the scenography very interesting. Like often nothing more than like a table or a or a bed. But that table or uh, or that bed, they come to life. They come in the performance in the play and be, and become like characters in the in the story. Which for me is really great and like a, a, a per perfect example for perfect example of how less could be much 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 more. Mm. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that often we have in South Africa the context is that we have a lot less, you know, than um, theater theaters in Europe. But I think that what one can make up with that is, as you say, this creativity and this capacity to to use things in really interesting ways. Um, so yeah, no, I'm glad I'm glad that that's um, you know something that you've taken away. Yeah, it's really I really like it. So I think I'm gonna steal some. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that's the point. I mean, I think that you know what I'm really excited about with this exchange is that um, I really hope that it is going to be an exchange that it's going to work in both directions. That you're going to take away some things from your experiences here in South Africa um, that will impact on the way you're working and, you know, on what you do next. And um, that will find ways to keep the relationship going also into the future. Um, but also that we're going to take away a lot of things from you. And I know that the writers are going to be part of the workshop next week are, are really looking forward to that. And I'm so excited to have this opportunity to have uh, 10 writers with you in a room 
um, working on new plays. And I hope that ultimately we can get all 10 of those plays, you know, produced. Um, the way this project is working is we will have a commission. There will be one, um, you know, commission play, um, either written by one person or maybe several people, we don't know. But um, but there will be a commission which is coming out of it, which will be going to Texmark at the, at the um, University of Johannesburg in, in October, which we're really excited about. Um, and it will be hopefully a first step towards then taking it further into professional production. But hopefully it will give birth to a lot more. So thank you so much for coming all this way to very cold South Africa in your very warm summer. Um, we're really happy to have you with us. And it's been such a pleasure spending this week with you. And thanks so much for this interview.